imagination that doesn't come from sensing the thing. So memory and imagination really are, for Hobbes, the same thing, just viewed slightly differently. He says that uh, imagination refers to the sensation that we have, which fades over time, while when we talk about memories referring to the, the object itself, the cause of that sensation. Now, you might say this can't quite be right, and it's not completely right um, so far, because we can imagine things that we've never had a sensation of. We can imagine things that we've never seen, for example, like we can imagine a unicorn. So how's Hobbes going to explain this? I mean, he says that imagination is nothing but decaying sensation, memory, because there's nothing in imagination that we haven't had a sense, a sensation of. But I say to you, I can imagine a unicorn even though I've never seen it. Well, you can imagine one, but you might have seen it from a cartoon or a Maybe, so somebody told you how it looks like. I've never, I've never seen, maybe in cartoons, I've seen a unicorn. I've never seen a purple unicorn or a green unicorn. How is that possible? Uh, your imagination, you can assemble, I guess, from your other senses, what you would figure a unicorn to be. You know what a horse is. You know what a horn is. Right. What color purple is. Good. So the whole point here is that in whole or by parts. So. We can have imaginations that combine the parts that we've experienced, that we have memory of, even though those combinations are things that we've never uh, had a sensation of. So I've had a sense of a sensation of a horse. I've had a sensation of a horn. I've had a sensation of the color green. I can combine those in my imagination even though I've never had a sensation of all of that together. Okay. I just want you to note on page 10, um, so this is paragraph 6, the mention here of what he calls natural kindness. Now, I don't care too much about what he's saying about that here, but I want you to make a note of the fact that he is talking about um, basically here he's describing, he's trying to give a, a physiological, materialistic account of dreams and why we sometimes get angry. And he's saying that it's because of you know, the heat that gets generated when we imagine an enemy, either in our dreams or in our own weak state. And so he's trying to give an account of this. And then he says, so, the anger that causes heat in some parts of the body when we're awake, so too when we're asleep, they can do the same thing. And then he says this, he says, in the same manner as natural kindness when we are awake causes desire, and desire makes heat in other certain parts of the body, also so too much heat in these parts while we sleep, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. The point is, he seems to think that there is such a thing as natural kindness and he needs to give an account of it. So natural kindness, presumably, he says this is something that triggers a desire. Uh, so presumably it's a desire, what? Maybe to help somebody else? To show kindness towards somebody else? And I'm emphasizing this because later on, I'll refer back to the fact that he does think there is such a thing as this natural. Also, I want you to note over on page 11, the reference to what he calls right reason. What he's saying here, um, sorry, so this is paragraph 8. What he's saying here is that there's no doubt that God can create what he calls unnatural apparitions. That is miracles. There's really no doubt, he says, that God can create miracles. But his point here is that we really shouldn't worry about that. We really shouldn't be too concerned about that. 
And in particular, we shouldn't suppose that we ever actually know when or even that miracles occur. So yes, 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 Hobbes is saying, God can create miracles. But this is really beyond our understanding. We can't know when they occur or when that they occur. We should content ourselves, ourselves with understanding the natural process of the world, the natural course of them. Because people talk about miracles, claim to find miracles in bad faith. They point to alleged miracles really in order to manipulate one another. So yes, maybe God can do this, but you shouldn't believe other people telling you about specific miracles. He says, but evil men, under pretext that God can do anything, are so bold as to say anything when it serves their turn, though they think it is untrue. So people are going to, in bad faith, invoke miracles to try to fool them. It is, therefore, he says, the part of a wise man to believe them no further than right reason makes that which they say appear credible. So you should only, you should only believe what they say insofar as what he's calling your right reason supports it. And he goes on to say um, uh, that this is really just superstition that leads people to rely on this. Um, and in particular, it's superstition that leads people to interfere with their proper construction of a common law. Again, this makes it seem as though failures to achieve a commonwealth, failure to construct a political society, is a failure of reason. It's a failure of proper reasoning. Um, I want to emphasize to you that this is really a radical idea here, that you should rely only on your own reason as far as you can reason together, as far as you can see the reasons for something. Re that you should only rely on that to form your beliefs, rather than dogma rather than somebody else's assertion, rather than the assertion that God works in mysterious ways. You should only rely on your own ability to reason through as best you can. Um, this is also very much a piece with the emergence of new science. This is a central <coughs> part of um, the, the, the central tenet of the Enlightenment. <coughs> that rather than relying on faith and dogma, we should reason things through for ourselves. This will be a central part of Kant's philosophy, so-called critical philosophy. Um, and I should also point out that this view itself, namely that we should only rely on our own reason as far as it can carry us, rather than faith or dogma asserted by somebody else was something that in Hobbes' day quite literally could get you executed. And the parliament in 1648 passed a law saying that it was a capital offense to deny the Trinity or the divinity of Jesus or the interpretation of the Bible that it asserted. Um, and Hobbes is really flouting that. Okay, on to um, chapter three. Okay, um, here he's just talking about sequences of thoughts. Um, and this is um, what he calls mental discourse. Mental discourse is just having one thought after another. Um, and I'll skip over this except to say that for those of you who have studied Hume, and in particular studied Hume on causation, it's very, very similar view here. We have experiences of one thing 
the sensations of one thing followed by another. And after that's repeated, we come to associate those two sensations. Um, let's go ahead to skip ahead to chapter four of speech. Speech, words, language, is what allows people to register their thoughts, register their mental contents, and record them and recall them to one another. This for Hobbes is one of the keys between human beings and mere animals, something we'll come back to. constant words is a dangerous thing because they can fool us into thinking that we're talking about the same thing when in fact we're talking about different things. Um, right, sorry, this is paragraph 24 there. The very bottom of page 21, he says, and therefore in real